What? Well, you know, it's helping the library, however many you get. So you just buy away. Hey, Jared, do me a favor. Oh, will you just come stand over here so I can make sure I have you in my, wherever you're gonna wanna stand. I just wanna make sure I get you, I have you in my, uh, you and your visuals in my uh, frame here. Yeah. I just wasn't sure if you'd want to stand behind it or in front of it. Or I have a, a lectern that I was going to put on the table, and then I was like, no, I'm taking this music stand out because then he can move it wherever he wants. It. Okay. Yeah, that's good. And that way you can move around too. Okay. Perfect. Okay. I hope we're ready to start because it's not down. Yeah, you're good all the way to there. All right, well, I think um, all the changes have kept a few people away and the crazy weather have kept a few people away and there are several people joining us on Zoom. Um, but <laughs> hi, everybody. Um, so welcome to the library. We're so grateful for Jared for coming to the library to talk to us tonight. And I hope that this is one of the many times that we'll have him back. Um, I was going to introduce you with your bio from your website, but then I was like, maybe he would prefer to give um, a less clinical introduction of himself, because I imagine you'll be talking a good bit about yourself as we go tonight anyway. So, um, I just realized, hey, here, would you run upstairs and get my laptop um, out of my office, because I just realized I might need to admit people for some reason the default on zoom now is that you have to have a waiting room and admit them and so yeah i haven't done that yet and so i hope that whoops that oh, wasn't good um it'll be a lot easier for me to moderate if i just have my laptop in my lap instead of coming <laughs> back and forth up here where we're trying to uh um <clears throat> Let's try to, I'll leave that on that mode so you can, right, right, suck it in. Um, <laughs> hey, Natalie, can you hear us okay? Okay. Um, so that's a few people, so we'll see who else uh, pops in when he brings, but I will just go ahead and turn time over to you, Joe. Thanks for being there and working virtually. I love um, I am going to introduce myself, but not. So, just first off, don't know what And what is it? Yeah, I won't have you kick people out of the crowd. I think we all know who you are. So, um, that's that. With good guys, bad guys. Right. So, this is just the title of this uh, presentation. Uh, it's really, really, really creative. Um, it's a lot of roommates, you know, I mean, a lot of roommates in the head have these things to deal with. And, uh, most people know what it's like to have kind of things that are unexpected going on in our heads. Um, I would like to um, ask a question. Now, because of the incredible size of the crowd, we're going to keep this really simple. Um, and, I'll only, and, I'll, and I'll peer really close here at Zoom. What's up? I know. Where's the camera? There it is. Uh, I just want to. I was going to ask you to like raise hands or eyebrows or whatever you're comfortable with, but just ponder silently upon this. I'm going to ask a bunch of yes or no questions, and you can just decide if the answer is on. If you want to raise your eyebrows or yes, then I'll, I'll watch and that's good. So, um, if you're nervous in crowds, indicate or don't. Nope, my eyebrows are very. Uh, how about if you're uncomfortable with parties? Uh, I'm just gonna raise my hand. Yeah, I just don't. Unless there's like a couch I can sit on where I'm hosting the party. 
where there's something like that, people come at me saying that's better. It's actually good. good. People would bring me brownies just all day. Um, how about um, irritating mood swings? Mood swings you feel like you can't control sometimes? It's kind of hard sometimes. How about you can't sleep or you struggle to sleep sometimes? Or maybe we sleep too much. Been there. How about uh, unmotivated day? If it's every day, thoughts for you. Uh, if it's not every day, I still have some thoughts for you. Sorry. My bad. Uh, no worries. Uh, how about if you've ever spent some time feeling like nobody cares about you? Okay. Good one. Good one. How about if you can't stand having the opportunity to continue to be confident, living in your desk? Yeah. So I've made a list of things in your head at this point that might or might not be a mental illness. Some of these things are just proclivities tendencies in our lives. And some of these things can actually be indicators of mental illness. I am not a psychological professional. I am not a medical professional. I am not here to diagnose a darn thing. I am here to um, mention one more thing and then I'll say what I want to say. How about you don't like having people stand behind you? Okay. It makes you uncomfortable, like really uncomfortable stand behind you. Okay. That's a big one. And we have to, it's good for us to pay attention to why it makes us uncomfortable to have people behind us. Uh, that's my biggest point, actually. Freaks me right now. But the point is this is there are a lot of nods, a couple of eyebrow raises, even on Zoom, I think. Somebody <laughs> there. Um, so you're not alone. Actually, actually, that is the case. Nearly one in five US adults deal with some kind of it's a AMI, any mental illness, so this is a broad spectrum of any kind of mental illness, right? This is reported as well, by the way. This is not an estimate, this is reported. Think of all the people who are mental illness. For example, I've never gone to a medical doctor of any kind that said, is that coming out of the Maybe. Would you mute that? Why did it start all of a sudden? That was weird. <laughs> I probably did something on over here. Oh, I thought I... Is this due? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We don't want to meet this side. And at any time throughout this, you are welcome to ask any questions, uh, make any comments, contribute on how you like. This is not just me talking. Uh, but in any case, that's what's, what's reported. And I've never been to a medical professional to say I have this issue. I need your help. So, yeah. And I know that I've got a few issues that I could probably use. But I've made it so far, and uh, one day I'll have some money, and I will. Okay. Interestingly, today, for as of 2017, young adults deal with mental illness more than old. Regular adults. I don't know. Regular adults. Middle-aged adults. Are okay. Seasoned and mature ones. Sure. How does it mean that they, there's more like reported cases? Or yep. Or just more reported cases, and also more intervention for young adults than uh, mature adults. And this is interesting too. More women than men report mental health issues and avail themselves of mental health services. Is that a stoicism thing? Maybe. Is it mental health issues? Choose to say. But this is what's reported. But the point here is that you're not, I'm not. In fact, many of us share very similar concerns and challenges. What's delightful is that everybody can be an ally, and it's helpful to know we're not alone. In fact, I know that in, there's some mental illness stuff in my family going back to my wife's side as well. And as I've sat and counseled with some of my kids, um, it has been very helpful to them. Is that the love thing? It's been very helpful to them to uh, know that they're not alone. To know that what they're experiencing is something, experiencing is something I experience, And that maybe some other friends are taking well. And they also learned that from their school counselors. School counselors are near. I just, I just, I love it. I have a dear friend who's a, a school counselor and my kids are parents. had a lot of benefit. Um, okay, so just real quick, this is the difference. 
I guess I can read it out loud for those of you who can see it. I just try not to read my slides. I'm what I'm encouraging public speaking students to not do. Mental illness is a disease or condition that affects how you think, feel, act, or relate to other people. Or disease or condition. For me, my obsessive compulsiveness borderline. It, does, it affects things, uh, but it's not to the point where I cannot talk myself down and avoid things. Uh, I want to lock the door three times and when I'm locking the doors, and I want to check three times, but I do. And sometimes I'm like, you know what, not today. Back off. You're getting too strong. And that is a blessing, lucky for me, because there are many who can't talk themselves down. And in those cases, we want to get some medical help there and help counseling. In any case, we're just trying to do some definitions here so that we can kind of understand what we're talking about. It can result from all these things, biological, environmental, genetic, life experience, all kinds of stuff. It's actually really hard in many cases for medical professionals, people who deal with these things, to say there's a one-to-one -one line. You can't always draw a line from this event to this mental illness. You can, in some cases, PTSD, you can often draw uh, and other things that are related to abuse and violence upon the system, be it mental, or emotional, or even physical and stuff. So it can result from all kinds of things. Uh, what's important to understand is that mental illness isn't because we did something wrong and screwed our brain up. It's because some things happened genetically, biologically, or externally that made our brain untrustworthy in some cases. Not all the time, but in some cases. Okay? So we know this is true. Not all mental, mental illnesses are diagnosed, period. And in fact, not all of them need to be diagnosed necessarily. I'm not saying don't. I am saying this very strongly. If you feel like you need some help, guess what? You probably do. And it's not going to hurt to seek help. It's never going to hurt to go get help. Having allies in our journey in life, there's nothing better. Knowing that we're not alone, knowing that there's somebody we can reach out to in crisis, moment of difference. It is really bad to feel alone when we're having a crisis, any kind of struggle or challenge. So get yourself a healthcare professional. Barring that, get yourself a mom or a dad or a sibling or a friend or a husband or something like that. Get somebody who you feel like you depend on. Okay. Many of us have struggles. Okay. So the point here is that I'm really not here fix you because you don't need it. Nobody needs fix. We're not broken. Um, we are not less than. We are not uh, a, a different category of human or creator, creation or being. We're just not. We are ourselves. Uh, quick question. Have, have you ever seen that object lesson uh, where people put water in a cup, put some food coloring in that cup, and then put bleach in or vinegar in, but actually has to be both to deactivate the food coloring. It's an object, often, often a religious object lesson about what Jesus does before he's um, An important part of that lesson that's always missed is that that water has always been water throughout that whole process. It's got a few additives that make it better or cleaner, but it's still water. It never changes. No matter what happens to us, no matter what we have to go through, we're still people. Beings created on this earth to live a life of value and productivity. Nothing changes, no matter what our talent is. So, again, I'm not here to fix it. I'm not a mental health care professional. But I have had some really interesting experiences that I get to share very shortly. And I do a lot of motivational speaking. So, that's why I give you this. <clears throat> I am here, still. I am here to help you know. That your desire to live life on your terms is valid. Not only valid, it is the exact right thing to do. Today, we can transform mental illness and trauma from baggage into a weapon. I didn't make up that radical phrase. Somebody else said, Your past, your baggage, your trauma, or your trauma, all these issues that you've gone through don't have to be baggage. They don't have to be something that pulls you down or holds you back. The weapons are. That you pull from to, to conquer the challenges of life. Hence, Lord of the Rings and lots of swords. By the way, I also have a sword. Okay, so I'm going kind of fast because I'm going to some juicy stories. 
But I really want to point out something very important. Now, now there's a very popular, I don't know if I should say very popular, but there seems to be a bit of a zeitgeist around just yourself and well. There's a meme of if you don't you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. True, absolutely. We we are entitled to people's best, right? And and when we have a relationship with someone, we should do our best to protect them. But when we can't be, we need to be able to be vulnerable. We need to be able to be weak with them and have the support of another person. And that's, that's, and that's just fact. But there's also something very important that we can never overlook, and that evolution is a real thing. It just really is. We, we adapt to our environment. There's generally racial evolution. There's biological and ecological evolution. It's real. It's real. It's as close as we can get to real facts. Now, this doesn't discount the presence of God, if that's in your belief system at all. Not at all. But evolution is real. We have all. I will tell you something. Very interesting. I had a weird childhood, but I'll get to it in a minute. Extra weird. And I grew up with about 30 other kids in a commune type situation. And was able to remove myself. Somebody wants is in the rating room, by the way. Do you want me? To? I was trying to say. I can admit them if you want. Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm going to admit them. Look at my wonderful stomach. Okay, it's big. Okay, so. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, so I got out of that thing when I was 17, and I'll be more specific here in a second. But hopefully, but it is fun. It'll be fun. Um, and about five or six years later, I was visiting the town where my father and his wife lived in their child. Um, and actually one of the kids that I grew up with was visiting as well. And he had, he dropped by the house to come and see me. We hadn't gotten along very much, but we, we'd had a very powerful shared experience. He came and visited for a little while. We talked for a little while. I was six years removed by that time from this organization. And I had gone through some serious change of my own accord and also because my took this place. That was wonderful. As he was walking out the door, this friend, Adam, said, Jared, I, can, I barely recognize you. You are. You, you do not resemble that kid. You like, thank you. That's why. There is evolution. There's guided evolution in our lives. We get to guide them. Isn't that exciting? I think progress is a biological imperative in life. Just it. Period. Furthermore, improvement is an imperative in life. We want to make things better. We want to make the world around us better for other people. We want to make our systems better. Sometimes we don't do it so well. And sometimes we have some politics that aren't civil, <coughs> among other things. We won't talk politics here. But improvement is just in our in our soul, in our core. We want to make things better. We want to make ourselves better. I mean, did somebody teach you to try to make yourself better? Or did you just kind of have that? Does anybody remember being taught that you're supposed to always be trying to get better? If you do, I'd love to hear it. I actually haven't heard that from anybody. I was never taught that I needed to try to be better. I was taught that I was a terrible person, but then I figured that out. And what's more, we can do these things. We simply can't believe it. We know we deep in our heart, at our center, at our core, we have no questions. That's why when we do have questions, we doubt it. And that stops us from accomplishing. When we do have difficult times that we don't quite get over or get through properly, or we're not happy, when we do have mental illnesses that are just getting in our way, we keep going. We keep going. Because we know we can. That doesn't mean that it's all going to all go away one day. That's not necessarily the case. My belief system, I believe that it will, it will eventually happen. But it's all set. But that doesn't mean in this life it's all going to go away. But the fundamental truth here is this. Your current state is not your final state. I know a woman who's 83. When she was 79, she changed religions. She grown up Southern Baptist. And then she changed to a different religion when she was 79. 
and has been on this incredible journey since then of study and growth. Incredible. People like the most terrible human being I've ever seen. She's just been diagnosed with terrible cancer. At 79, she was up. You could see it like a video game. Do we like gaming, you guys? You like, I hope so. As you're gaming in like Breath of the Wild, you get powers, you get you get abilities, you get weapons, you get objects, and you become better, right? And when you're in Smash Bros, you get better and better at stuff. But I don't care. That's what I do. And then when I play Doom, because all I want to do is go into the world and shoot things rather than attack them, I get bigger hunts. I earned it. Our current state is not our final state. Video games, and most importantly, it. that is the main point we're trying to get to here. So, story time. <clears throat> Everybody seen that vine with the guy? Story time. It's fun. Um, anyway. So story time about me. Why am I talking about this? Well, um, it's a long story, but I'll keep it short. Uh, you may have heard of Scientology. You can just raise your hand or say, yeah, have you heard of Scientology? Uh, Tom Cruise, Leah Remini, a couple of other folks. I think John Travolta. Anyway, in the 60s, some people who were practicing Scientology in Oxford were kicked out for being too which you should be like, what? Yeah, because Scientology is already weird. They use this e-meter and they read your, your, all these electrical impulses in your body to help you, you know, fix, fix your energy and just be very valuable. And deal with your things that you're responsible for. And, you know, take ownership of yourself and your journey. And it's good stuff. But an e-meter is a little bit different. Um, so, anyway, these folks were kicked out because they were too weird. <clears throat> it was a 60s. And they started a cult. And it was called the Process Church of the Final Judgment, which sounds freaky. And it was. It was the weirdest, one of the most controversial cults that's ever existed, actually. Started in the UK, in Oxford, moved around the UK for a little while, was to Yucatan for a little while, and then came to the USA, traveled for a while all over Canada and USA and New Orleans, LA, San Francisco, and Boston, Chicago, New York, all this stuff. Until finally establishing itself after growing and grabbing new acolytes and adherents and members into a commune. They were a full on commune cult called the Process. And when they were in California and San Francisco, they recruited this young woman, young mother, with her husband and child. But then the crazy woman ran the cult with microbes. So that woman married one of the British found it. She talks like this right through his nose. You see, he's got big bushy eyebrows. Married him, had another boy. No. And then a couple of years later, had another boy. That was but with another dude. Who was your boss? Great. Right. And, uh, and so I was born into this cult after it was well established with several branches in New York, Chicago, New Orleans, uh, and San Antonio. And that was how I grew up until I was 17. Moving quite a lot because they couldn't seem to pay the rent. Maybe they were they donated homes. I lived in New York for a few years on just this one big brownstone floor of the building. Um, lived in all up and down the East Coast, Pennsylvania and stuff. And then all the kids wound up living in Dallas when I was about 10 or 11. And we all lived there because, well, that's where they started their little private school. So we never went to public school. Didn't want us exposed to the crazy world. Bad news. Luckily for us, the leader of the Dallas branch of this cult uh, was insane. And I don't say that mental illness was. I say that evil was. She was a bad human. She was a megalomaniac. She had two languages. One was abuse and the other was sympathy. So she could be abusing us mentally or emotionally and verbally one day, and the next day she could be tenderly trying to teach us all how to cook or bake bread. She taught me how to bake bread. So. She was very hard. She made it very scary to be a kid. And actually, I was always scared because the adults treated all the kids like animals or afterthoughts. We weren't raised by our parents. We were separated from our parents as early as possible. As soon as our mothers were done nursing us, we were separated from our parents to be raised by the cult. You can actually Google Scientology and you can find out that Scientology does exactly 
fact, most cults do that. It's a key indicator of what an actual cult is. <clears throat> so some things that you might think are cults are probably look at that. But there are other indicators that make this sense. Football properties. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> so I was not raised by my mother nor my father. I did know who my mother was. I called her by her first name. It was Magdalene. That's Mary Magdalene. Whenever I saw her, which was very, very rare, because we didn't live in the same branch, I would say, God bless you, Magdalene. Not because she's me, but that's because what, that's what we were required to do. A couple fun tidbits about growing up this way is every morning there was a prayer circle with some song and some scripture and some hymns written by folks in the cult. But we were not allowed to say one word for you. Started at 7, we were up at 6.30, 6 o'clock, we weren't supposed to speak. There was supposed to be no noise until that thing was over, which was fun and sometimes hard. Um, and uh, another couple of quick things about this is that they established, again, several firm branches. They bought a headquarters in Arizona. Then they changed to a headquarters in southern Utah. And throughout my whole life, we were always doing animal rescue. Always lots of animal rescue. Um, and that's probably because of who was the born and way more died in the basement or in the back room of the home somewhere there. Died. Horribly gross things. I don't like pets as it, as it is now. I, we have a cat, so they're and chickens because they pay rent, uh, but otherwise, no pets for Jerry. Um, I just, I like them, I don't want them. Uh, so there was a lot of animal rescue growing up, and then when they bought the headquarters in southern Utah, they turned it into an animal rescue. So it was still a cult, but they also did a lot of animal rescue and rehabilitation. And we kids, there were a lot of us, were driven from Dallas, Texas, in southern Utah, every summer. And we set up tents and helped build this animal rescue site in southern Utah for two months. We would... The cult portion is gone. Okay. Yeah, but... Yeah. No. Cult's all gone. No. By no means. Yeah, by no means. Yeah. And I was trying to get to that. Oh, sorry. I need to jump ahead. Sorry. So, I have an animal lover over here. So, we, we have animal lovers. I love animals. I just don't want them in my house. Yeah. I have kids. Anyway, um, a lot of kids, seven kids. Those are the I know, right? They, they said, too. Um, as you know. So, um, we helped build Best Friends, version one. And I, I mean, I've scooped just a quick list. I scooped at least two tons of poo. I did the math. A dog poo from the from the dog area, dog town. I built five or six cat runs. I helped put the plumbing in for two of the many buildings that are there. I helped sink water supply line for about ten miles total over the over the five years, the five summers that we went out. I did a ton of drywall, a little bit of roofing, really terrible rain, a lot of indoor plumbing. I learned to not worry, to not be intimidated or scared of doing hard work and trying new things. So it was hard work and it was really lame because we worked for 12 to 15 hours a day. But I learned to work hard and I learned that I could do these things. So, I mean, I know how to use a hammer. That's kind of fun. Um, that's how we helped build that friend. In 1993 or four, they began the process of dropping all culty religious stuff. And in 94 to 95, they became officially just a totally animal rescue nonprofit organization still run by the original founders of that cult, but just doing the animals in the way that they do, doing it very successfully, doing it in a rat. Um, but that's where I, that's the key thing, which is why I can do really cool British accents. I heard my earlier King one, like just like right there. Well, I could also do Cockney, right? Because some of them had Cockney accents, right? Well, so it's not that it's the leader of the cult. There's a man named Gabe. And he spoke very softly and slowly. And he was creepy as hell. Uh, he's a lot less creepy. Kind of weird. Soft hair, though. Um, all that to say, they, while they were still getting started in the Southern Utah version, they still owned their ranch in Arizona. When I was 17, by the time I was 17, I'd been on my own personal journey this fall, and it was time for me to get back. So I did. I caused some trouble and got banished to the old Arizona ranch to do some caretaking before they could get it sold. 
And my plan was to get banished to it so I could be out of the thumb, out from under the thumb of this, this lady who ran the gallery. So she couldn't see me anymore. And then I was just going to take off. And return. Hmm. Well, while I was there, one month after I got there, hopeful, about 80% of the members walked. They were all dissatisfied. They hadn't been treated well. The vision of what they wanted to join and be a part of was, was basically gone. And so it folded. And all the faithful stuck around and made best friends. And since it folded, I got to leave that Arizona ranch and move in with my dad. With Kanab, because he'd been kicked out of because he wouldn't give up his girl, his daughter, to be raised by the great people of Dallas. So he held strong. Good on him. Good job. He also gave me my first ride, bike riding lesson when I was nine. So he tried to be a dad, which was very uh, admirable because it was all really proud of him. Really proud of him. And now to the journey that I was on. So at the age of 11, I was torn out of public school and put in this, this, this private school that they had. And I was so mad because it was the first time in my life I'd been in the same school for the second year. If you're familiar with people who move a lot, that's one of the complaints. Is I was in different schools. How could you be around in a different school? I did that all the time. I was in three schools for my first grade. So from fourth grade, I was like, at the end of fourth grade year, as it's coming to a close, I'm telling all these people, I'm friends, I, I'm gone. There's no help here. Lo and behold, I show up on the first day of fifth grade. Same school. I see all these people who I like and who like me and who don't avoid me, who don't glare daggers at me if I make any noise in the house or in the classroom. Felt safe. The school is different than the same school. And then one month into my fifth grade, they moved here. Sent me And I, arrived, I landed in Dallas, peeved, furious that they'd done this to me. And then, because I was so mad, I didn't do my schoolwork in the terrible little school that they had. And so the leader, the crazy leader, remember, not clinic, but just evil crazy, decided to have a heart to heart one night after banishing me to my room because I wouldn't do the homework. She came up with cold hot dogs and baked beans. That was a very common dinner. There wasn't any. Cold hot dog and beans. I said, Jared, can we have a problem? And she had this, she said all kinds of things that I've completely forgotten because I've been built right out of my room. And when she was done, she said, I know it's for some, for some of us, it's a lot harder to do school. We just don't have the ability sometimes mentally to, to be successful. But I, I want you to work hard. And she walked out the door having called me dumb with a cold plate of beans and hot dogs. I gave the beans and hot dogs to a dog because that's disgusting. Although hot, baked beans with a bit of sauce. I don't eat hot dogs. I was so mad at what she'd done, what she called me essentially, she just totally insulted me, that at that point I said, you know what, I'm going to go just to show that I'm going to go. And so I excelled at school from then on out, but I was still angry. Defiance became my emotion, my defining emotion. Yeah, she was not that nuanced, but you're right. Reverse psychology can be very effective. She was not that deft. She was just a hammer. Um, but she probably thought that it would work because I started, I was number one in the class and that was, so was the rhythm. It wasn't a hard school. I'm not saying a lot about it. It was not a hard school to succeed. Um, but defiance became my emotion from then on. And because of that, my temper became huge. And I would use violence with my words. I would call people names if I lost my temper. I would lash out physically when I was angry, but I would lose my temper. And I... Just out of nowhere, I burst into tears. I'm called out by an adult, rebuked by an adult. I would just, I couldn't control it. I was out of control. I couldn't control my emotions. Um, I didn't know why I never felt safe. Um, I didn't know why my mother and my father, who I barely really knew, had given me up to this terrible organization. There must have been something wrong. And so at about age 13, I got fed up with not being in control of my emotions, being always scared, and being feeling like the whole world was broken. And so I started meditating. And I started doing a lot of exercise, punching back. Because I'd seen this great movie called Rocky. And Rocky's like, <laughs> so I, I learned how to box sort of with Rocky. I started pounding on him. Started to add punch and rap. And at the same time, so in doing that, I started to get more introspective and seeing what was going on in my life. And I got more physically 
in control of myself, which gave me a great deal of mental and emotional control. Because by golly, there's not a lot more effective when you are angry and frustrated because nobody's paying attention to you, when you get blamed for doing things that you didn't do, and you get yelled at for not washing conditioner out of your hair, although it wasn't me, it was Manuel who washed the conditioner out of his hair. I have to say. Anyway, we all got yelled at for not washing Crazy stuff. There's nothing better than wailing on a heavy bag as hard as you can to get out all that frustration. I give it to you myself. Would totally do it. And I still do it. So. Um, at the same time as I was getting some better control of my emotions and some better control of my physical state, I was reading books like crazy. So in the Dallas Public Library System, there's an Oak Lawn branch, and it was a mile and a half from our house where we lived. And I would be there every other day. I'd check out five books, and I'd read two or three of them before I went back the next two days later. I read every single fantasy and science fiction book. I read almost every thriller, Unfortunately, almost every horror, very twisted season, books of the age of 12, that I read. Um, I read so many romance books. Oh boy, Danielle Steele's a good writer. Oh my gosh. Oh, I shouldn't have fit that anymore. Anyway, uh, so much Danielle Steele. Learned a lot. Anyway, um, read uh, all the comics that they had many times. Spider Man, oh my God. So while I was on this journey of trying to get my emotions under control, get my physical abilities under control will not be physical, right? I was reading about heroes. I was reading about heroes who would do the most dangerous, heroic things of love, family, just because it's the right thing. I was reading about heroes like those guys in the Lord of the Rings, Frodo, who was quiet. He didn't fight a lot. And um, one of my favorite fantasy writers is R.A. Salvatore, who wrote The Ice of the Nails. And some of the characters in there will stick with me for all of my life. I started reading about these heroes who would do everything for true love. So I became a romantic and said, one day I will have a dream. And I will be the most perfect man so that she will notice me and see that I am. And this will be good. And I will fight for what's right no matter what. I will be like Wolfgar, a Bruin, resist be like Elric, even though he's crazy. I will be like these people. These are my dreams. While I was doing that, it turns out my sin. It just gave me a new reality. I didn't know what family was like, really, but I saw what family was like in the heroic books. So those heroic books became kind of my like my purpose, helping me to know this is how I want to be. So as you can tell, I'm a physical specimen, right? It's really helped. I'm not. I have lots of good reasons for that, but also I like cake. Um, there's also been a bad shoulder and a bad knee. Bad stuff. I used to do endurance events, and I'll do that again one day. He said, I really will one day, I think. Yeah. Anyway. <clears throat> so, that was the journey that I was on internally, personally, even though I was, in fact, I sort of became a practice Buddhist, because I sure didn't believe the God did. That God. He was an angry God. He would change his mind all the time. He would hurt me. Uh, and if he was the God that these people were worshiping, I wanted to do it. But I didn't know. At the time, I do know. In, in any case, but that's not what this is about. That's my story, though. That's the story I wanted to tell you, is that I was on a journey of escape, followed by physical escape. Escape into control of my emotions, my physical ability. Escape into a world that I felt like I could control in my own mind, because I had nothing that I could control in the world around us. Nothing could be at all. We were just sent and told to do these things we have to do. And I got out at age 17 and landed in Kanab, Utah. Fell in with a real crazy crowd with long, weird hair and piercing. They taught me to dance. They taught me to love heavy metal. Still love heavy metal. They taught me to get out of my shell. They taught me that I could continue in my journey. Understanding myself, understanding why I was the way I was, why I couldn't look people in the eye, ever, for like, like I, the first time I looked at somebody in the eye, I was 16, that I could recall, at least as, as an adult, or looking into an adult's eye, I was scared of all, of all the adults. You want to hear that fun story, by the way? So I was being yelled at, this other guy who I was growing up with, 
because we had left the home that we lived in messy, gotten back from our uh, pilgrimage to Kanab. Um, and apparently this crazy woman who ran the, the cult, the, that, that branch had gone over to the house that we lived in and thought that we'd made the mess that, that was left the whole summer that we were there. And so we were brought in to be yelled at, me and this kid from Dawson. And she's yelling and yelling and yelling and yelling. And in my head, I'm just like, for one, I like it. I definitely didn't leave this mess. Number two, eyes are proud. And Mark, the other kids. Number three. Number four, why can't I leave this mess? And at that point, I said, you know what, I'm going to. And so I looked at this woman, her name is Lucia, right in front of me. And I think nobody had ever looked at her eyeballs, but she was so fierce. She beat her to the top. I said, from then on, I stared at her right in her eyeballs every time she looked at me. To the point where one day, not long before I was back, probably partly, it's probably why I was back. She brought me into this new house that we were in. I said, Jared, have a seat. Okay. I sit down. By that time, I am physically in good shape. Her large bear of a husband had tried to put hands on me and beaten him up and fought back. And just wouldn't let him. She said, she sat me down and said, Jared, can you even listen to me? I said, Lucia, I never listened. She did not expect me. So if I talk to you now, are you listening? No. Go right ahead. And she did for a little while, and I just looked at her. And then she petered out and said, Jared, are you even listening? I just said I'm not. No. It's not even going anywhere. I'm done. I said, fine. I got done. And was sent off to Canada, or Arizona, not long, not long. Um, I was delighted by how calm and controlled I was in the face of her. I loved how but I was very petty as well. So all of that is a journey. All of that is a battle that I got to fight. I've been on the fight journey ever since. I wrote a memoir. It's not published. One day somebody will say, hey, I want to talk to you. There's a chapter about me forming myself like play, the partnership that I got. Uh, that is a cathartic chapter. All of this comes to this. Emotional and psychological strength can be built. Deliberately. Carefully with large heapings of forgiveness. We are not here to just be in a state of difficulty and having our mental illnesses and the trauma and the things that we've been through overcome us and beat us down. We have to forgive ourselves and say, this is, this is not something I, this is a mental illness. My brain is untrustworthy at this point. I don't blame myself for that. What I want to do is learn how to make this have less impact, less impact, less impact. And I want to use all these experiences I've had where I've not failed, or I have failed, or I've succeeded, and use those things as knowledge weapons, knowledge swords, and maces, and morning stars, and pikes, if I like swords, and shields to get through the rest of the life. So this can happen. There is a key ingredient to building emotional and psychological strength, and that took me forever to come to this. And that is that internal honesty. so good at lying to ourselves. We are so good at building narratives. Everybody is good at this. Master manipulators. Extra manipulators. They lie to themselves so well, they can manipulate others. They believe that what is actually not true is somehow in the realm of possibility. Not true. I've been working with somebody who uh, turned to lying as a safe coping strategy, because this person never had anything safe in their life, never had anything private in their life, until they were about 13. And this person just lying is like second nature, it's his first nature. It's so easy. Little things, little lies, weird, dumb lies. Why would anybody even think to say that as a lie? It doesn't make any sense. And the biggest, most important thing we've had to try to work on is just helping this person become honest and determined. Because they would swear up and down that something was true. And I clearly demonstrated it just wasn't true. There's no way it could be true. So we had to get to the point where this person could start saying, wait a second, why do I keep saying something factually false, demonstrably false? It's true. And that took some time. It was never like a, 
<laughs> there was never an epiphany of I can do it now. It was very much a I can. And then, no, you didn't quite get that, but good try. You're a little closer now, and so on and so on. This is the key, internal honesty. We have to be able to see what is reality. So one of the things I think that we can be very honest about is separating the condition from the identity. For example, we love Hortensia. I am Hortensia, and I'm schizophrenic. The fact that I'm schizophrenic or have schizophrenia doesn't change who I am that way. And it doesn't change who I want to be. Have you heard of that song, I'm Never Changing Who I Am? It's a nice song. It's got an interesting message, right? I'm never changing who I am. It's in Perks of Being a Wall, Being a Wallflower. It's a very catchy song, and it's got some good messages to it. But there's a problem. At our core, we can't change who we are at our deepest, most you know, fundamental being person for that we are, that we are simply members of and if you believe in God, your son or daughter. That can't be changed. Literally everything else. Can be changed. If we have internal core principles that we don't like, we can change them. Everything else can be changed. When it comes to mental illness and especially uh, trauma responses that come from trauma in our lives, like I have strong PTSD and I have major trust issues, but not the way you think. Like very much not what you think. I immediately trust because I expect I want everybody to be trustworthy, and if they break my trust, I never trust them. And I'm working on it. In any case, we have trauma response, we have mental mental illness. Those things make some of our brain function out of our control, and that's okay. Because remember that image that's a little faded right now. There's there are two sides. In fact, there are two sides to our brains: the rational. The ration and the emotion. Those things help us build tension. And that tension that we build between the rational and the emotional actually gives power to move forward. Without that tension, we don't move forward. Or at least we don't move forward in any way that makes any sense. It's just kind of random to rational. It's rational. It's hard. And emotional. It's all over the place because emotions show up in the last three to ten seconds. And sometimes we hold on to them and build an estimate. And we should just let them go. But between the rational and the emotional, we can build some tension in us. And it's not a good bad fight in this case. Between the rational and emotional, it's just simply a nice conflict. And as we build that tension, we can change who we are. Because I mean, really, why not? If we want to, we can. You're not going to change the fact that you're a human being. I have a nose. I guess I could take the nose off, but that would be significant weirdness. I would feel sort of. What's that? Yeah, oh, well, we're no snake guy. Little snake boy for guy. So, number one, you can change it. You can change it. Not, I mean, at the very core of it, very value, worth of it. Because we're always, we always have value, no matter how many dumb things we've done or bad things we've done. People who've done terrible crimes, they're still a child. They're still, they still deserve to be treated like people. They should pay for their crimes. Period. If society has come up with some nice ethical ways to pay for their crimes, that'd be great. But you're not broken. You're not bad. You just have a unique garden of challenges to weed. Your soul, our soul, our mind, our heart, they are gardens. Where we're supposed to weed and feed all the time. So, um, a couple of quick notes, and then I want to give a couple of tips. And exercises. These are just key. Proving, increasing. We are imperative. I, I cannot abide it. I agree, staying chill. I am the dude sometimes. If I could grow the hair and the beard one day, maybe I will. Wear a robe everywhere I go. I certainly rocked out the music coming out here. I love it. I can be chill, but I can also improve. Right? I talked about um, being forgiving ourselves, but you see everywhere, you see improving and increasing it's the biological imperative, right? Plants grow. We get sick, we typically get better. We get an injury, we typically get better. I mean, for the number of injuries I've had in my body, I can walk 
and that's a pretty cool thing. I've had two surgeries on my knees, and I can walk. Like, had my shoulder, my shoulder completely rebuilt six months ago, completely, like some things cut, and other things shaved off. I, I got better. I have tiny little muscles, but they're getting bigger too every time I do some work. It's a biological imperative, and it's a soul imperative. Something in our field that we want to improve with treatment. Um, denying it does no long term good. It is good to forgive ourselves. I mean, when we make a, a mistake, when we fail, we have to say, well, that's part of life. You're supposed to. I'm not going to go seek out my failures. I'm not going to go try hard to make stupid mistakes, screw things up. I definitely don't want to mess up my relationships. But I'm going to be honest about my mistakes. Internal honesty is huge. I made a mistake. Well, how did that mistake doesn't last forever. It only lasts forever if I don't make a new choice based on that. Right? It's awesome. We have to be forgiving of ourselves and then drive ourselves to go. And remember, and this is a term from an addiction recovery program. A lapse is not necessarily a relapse. That comes with all kinds of addictions and it also comes with all kinds of cycles of behavior. A lapse is not a relapse. So, a couple of quick techniques that I found that work for me. There's something called the second breath. The second breath is just a technique for not overreacting. We have reactions. Things make us mad or make us sad, especially political things, especially political things on, especially weird things that people do. It seems like they're a bad person, defending terrible actions and problems. The second breath helps us take a moment to react. And literally, the technique for this is take a breath. How often are you aware of your breathing? Have you ever laid in bed and suddenly become aware of your breathing? I hope so, because that's a fun experience. Because as you become more aware of your breathing, you're like, I better keep breathing. What's the last time I took a breath? It's a weird few minutes, right? You've probably been there. It's really, really bizarre. In this case, it's a slow, deep second breath in and And it's nice to visualize something, right? And if you want to think. I still, but I don't need to express. I've taken a break. Instead, if you are having an argument, and it's a very strong difference of opinion, and you are finding that your mouth is drying up, your heart's going fast, and you're having struggle, trouble articulating yourself, this is exactly what to do to get your thoughts in order and to do better in that situation. Do not make them. Stand up for what you know is right. Take a second. Stay there. When you're breathing normally, you can talk. Your oxygen will happen properly in your brain and in your in your lungs. Your heart will beat at a steadier rate and your mouth will be still. Second and third breaths are huge parts of public speaking. Another one is a second one. This is where we try to be a little more honest and take a little more care in how we're understanding this. Often, and this is this is adapted from a presentation I did to writers. Um, we have to be honest with ourselves. Say, I, I, I took some input in just now and I have this reaction. To it. But is what I've just taken in as input, is it, is, if I understood it right, or did I just get a piece of the picture? I, I, maybe I need another another one to get a more complete picture of what's actually happening here. And that can be with our brain too. That can be with, no, I don't think I need to wash my hands just because I went outside. And uh, no, it's okay if I don't do wildly productive things. I don't need to feel close if I don't get everything. It's okay. I'll get a few things done. I'll take a break. I'll keep my time. Or as the same person, I can treat yourself. I won't take it easy. Take a second look and make sure we get a full, complete picture. We could all do this going down. And getting honest is another part of getting the whole picture. 
you have to say, now do I have the whole picture? Boy, that doesn't happen much in, t in today's society, does it? Getting honest, most of us are wondering if we have lots of reactive stuff. We also need to get honest with ourselves. When we say, is that something that's not real? Have I just told myself something that's not real? Have I just told myself that I suck? I think I did. That's not good. Have I just told myself that if I don't say this to this person, I'm a bad person? Have I told myself that I have to attend that event or I'm a bad friend? Is that none of that? Right? Be honest with myself. And in my case, I have to be honest with myself and go do something unpleasant and awkward sometimes. I used to travel a lot from Java and Omaha. And I made the terrible error of not asking, not fighting for a better team. And I did not get a team of what I did. When I want to fight for I had to sit between two people for the whole the people behind me, touching me. I have sensory issues sometimes. Not a lot. But I got off that first time. I rarely shake that big and I remember two of them. One was amazing. It was a phenomenal miraculous. That was this. I was out of my mind. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't pee very well. I was physically shaking. And from then on, I have known to fight for the right team. Which I don't think I remember It's great. But I learned to fight for myself and be honest. That no, I can't. I can't actually push through this. No, I can't white knuckle through this flight. That's twelve hours. It's going to kill me, or it's going to make me feel like it's going to kill me. Another thing, and this is something I cover a lot in the podcast. I have a podcast. So I, write books. I, I write books. Anyway, you guys have my books. You have all fantastic. I have some of my books in the car. I always carry. Are you my family? I write books. Okay. Anyway, on one of my podcasts, it's called Win the Moment. I believe that we can see. I don't think we should put pressure on ourselves to do this, but we can see. Life is full of moments. Not every moment has to be a moment. And we need to take the pressure off ourselves, but every moment we can win. If we see, if we see an opportunity, let's say, um, okay, today, that was in a paper. So, okay, I was a little bit late, like for two minutes, because I had to make dinner, because my wife is a full time lawyer in Salt Lake City, and she gets back around 6 30, 6 35. Sometimes late. And I was making beef stroganoff because it's Thursday pasta, right? But I had completely forgotten to get mushrooms. I mean, I, I, you, you and me both, but you do not eat beef stroganoff. It, otherwise, it's like beef alfredo or something. Yeah. That's a chip for chicken or something. Anyway. So it's 5.57. I've got everything prepped except for I don't have mushrooms. I went, thank you. Yeah. So I got our zoomed over to Smith's at illegal speeds, ran in and got some mushrooms, and I was almost jogging, which I don't think optimistic. Almost jogging from the produce section to, to check out. But, and this old lady about this tall says, excuse me, sir. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't work here. And I'm like, oh. yeah. And so I did. I hope we got a watermelon. It's very deep, big, big heavy watermelon. Put it in the car to have a good So I had a nice opportunity to win the moment there. Actually, help. And that, that was good for me. I felt good. There are times I'm not doing that. Uh -huh. And I feel like I've lost it. Winning moments and taking moments where I can make a statement to myself that this is important. It's important to me to treat this moment this way, to treat this person this way, or to do this work or to not do this work in this way, to talk in this way. I'm going to take this moment as an opportunity to make a statement for myself. I'm still there. I'm still in the battle. I'm going to keep getting better. Right now, I'm going to get a little better. Are we good? And, and I'll look back on this moment as, hey, all right, I won that. That's a good time. Okay. I mentioned this before. Make allies. It's a huge part of our life. There are techniques for making allies. There are various things. The first part of it is not so scary. And it is to say, hi. That's all.
or if we have friends, we don't feel like they're people we can trust to call. We just have to push ourselves. One time, I have a quick mental a thought experiment. Uh, would you like to be that person? Somebody can call. And kind of lay things out. The person. We all know that most people are good people. We do. Your friend. I can't. They want to be that person. They crave being. And when you can make a friend, not just a friend, but an ally, somebody you can trust to share these things with, you will build a friendship that will last forever. Especially if you make yourself an ally for them as well. So you want to be an ally? Yeah, yeah, then and they want to be as well. And last, this is a fun one, gamify life, man. So I'm, I've just made a spreadsheet, and that's why I put this on here. I just made a spreadsheet. So um, I asked my wife, honey, what is something you really want that I can't just go buy myself? It's like, hey, I know, thank you. <laughs> I can buy cake anytime or make any time. I can get my daughters and my sons to make sure it's fun. That didn't help. Try She said, well, what about Gimli's ash? It was like the angels saying from the heavens, oh, you are so good. So I said, thank you. And I put that as my prize. So I actually have to earn 3,000 points between the time I started the spreadsheet, because I think last week or the week before, and the end of the week, by doing certain activities, tracking. And tracking it every day also gives me points. I'm supposed to track the calories taken in. I'm supposed to do 30 minutes, or I'm supposed to do exercise. 10 minutes of exercise is two points. 20 minutes of exercise is five points. 30 and so on. So the goal being an hour of exercise and tracking. So I track these simple activities, give myself points, and if I have 3,000 points by the end of the year, I get to buy myself games. That's how I am gamifying one aspect of my life. You're an enabler. I don't actually have <laughs> So I also need to save a lot of people, which I'm going to find out. But maybe I'll try to gamify a way to save. Maybe I'll just have to do some more freelance right now. I don't know. Uh, we can gamify aspects of our life. We can give ourselves point systems. We can give ourselves levels up. Whatever, whatever we feel like works for us. I really like gamifying. Um, good. So then, final statement here. Again, your current state is not your current state. I had a really uh, moving experience about uh, I was at uh, an event called Life in February last year. It's this thing that used to be a few I used to post. It's a science fiction and fantasy just convention. Not quite like fans, although some like panels, classes, really cool stuff. I get to go to that through some panels and sell some books and talk a lot. I was doing a big book signing with some other, with a bunch of the authors there. I was talking to this young woman about life. Um, I'd reached, a few months before I'd received a new assignment from the church. Um, that, that was tech. And um, mentioned, I mentioned it to her because uh, she said, oh, wow, that's amazing. And we talked some more. Um, and I mentioned, I said this, your current state is not your final state. She was in a party. And when she walked away, this tall, skinny, lady, kind of messy hair, kind of guy you just like, showed up. So I'm not to anybody. Oh, my gosh. You ever heard that? Yeah, we talked. So we just went silent a ways. We started talking to him about the life he was living there, how he was struggling with some things, how he wasn't struggling with some other things. He was worried that he should be struggling with some things. Um, for example, he, he, he said that he he thinks that he's pansexual. He's like, Great. And I, I asked him to describe what that meant because I wasn't entirely certain of what he meant. And as he described that, I helped me understand where he was coming from. And then we talked some more about how he wants to be part of his family, this one's family, some other um, And after he just kind of unloaded on me, which was, I was already listening to, um, from other sources, just said, dude, current state is not your final state. 
I'm not saying that anything's going to change about your sexuality or anything. I'm just saying the current state, who you are, where you are, where your mind is, your heart is, that final state, there's plenty more. There's plenty of opportunity out there for you to grow, to become more aware of yourself and of the world around you. To this, this, this might not pass, but you'll certainly can move forward. And he's like, like, thank you. And then he found me as I was leaving about 20 minutes later. Like, Could you say that again and so I can film it? <laughs> like, uh, I don't think so. Um, so I kind of said no on that one. Um, shout out. This is true. I hope that as you look at your current state, you see things true. Good. Not just your red or your awesome mask. But I'm I'm really happy. How oh, I've done this. How oh, I've handled this. These achievements that I've made. I'm not done. I am happy. You have to be happy with our state. We have to be content. Who we are, we are doing. And I can't stress enough. That if there are things that we feel like our core principles does and they're not taking us where we think they should go, or we think we should go, we can change. We can become exactly who we want. Exactly. There is no question about it. I do not resemble it. Except with this, with this ridiculous nose. I do not resemble it. Actually, I was a little round. Oh, yeah, I do. Internally, mentally, I've discovered there is nothing. I've discovered I have the power to make any change I want. I've discovered that I have a long way to go. And I'm comfortable knowing this. And I know exactly how to get through that one, step by step. And I'm comfortable with how long it's going to take. Back then, much impatience. Your current state is not your final state. That's all I got. Resounding applause. I, I'm happy to answer questions about literally anything. Yes. What? I what I do is not really playing. I flail and push buttons like a maniac, and my older two boys beat the living car out of me. And my girls beat, and my nine-year-old just out of my So I doubt. I have seven kids. Every single one of them is just destroyed. Except for no, no, she can't. I will say, um, as I grew up in a college, I write books now because I mean, books saved me. Chris Jarabithia changed my life. Utterly changed my life. Um, my first book that I published is called Beyond the Cabin. It's actually not the same of that child. It took 10 years of events that happened in my life, condensed them into a uh, three or four month period of this character's life. Uh, and he goes on the journey I went over a year or so. But he does it in three or four months. And I fictionalized quite a bit as well to make it not as um, aggressive. Is that large spider? Do you like spiders? You might want to. You're, it's not on you, it's behind the chair. So. It's okay, no danger. I don't know what you guys do about spiders. Did you just let them stick around? Um, we kill them. I've never seen one of them. Well, there, I think that is inappropriate. I'm sorry if I. <laughs> Um, if that had been April, my daughter, she would have actually jumped out of the chair, possibly, and shrieked something worse than the world. So no, no special. But yes, yeah, folks. Any other questions? Yes. Do you uh, still have contact with people from yep. the US? Yes. Sure. Um, I am. I am really far from that. Farther than anybody else has really. Extremely LDS, and uh, writing public. Some of those young people I grew up with had some Some of those young people I grew up with had some stay. Some of employees, that's right. Um, and several of us, most of the others, have gone on to other lives. Some of them are really struggling. Weirdly, me and my brother, my wife, and my brother, he's a professor at the University of Iowa. But we do stay in touch. My brother and I absolutely got a wife. Wonderful child. He's older than me. 
brother's older than me, their child is older than me. So pretty funny too. I don't know. Struggle like crazy to step by take um, we have a private uh, Facebook group between us young kids. It's called Book. There's also some private Facebook groups for former members of the original cult before it turned into something much more. And I'm in touch with those guys because I have a podcast about my cult. Nobody else can help me that. There are times I need questions in. So I'll go to another guy. They knew me when I was born, but the, the original cult schism didn't even call this guy. So, one that turned into the foundation is generally the best friend. One that did cross. Yeah, so I, I do pay that. But very little. And I've been to best friend, best friend, I don't know, five times, six times. It's weird. My latest podcast episode is that. I was black and physical. Oh, really? I, I offended them. What's that? From best friends. Yeah. Well, yeah, from the cult, they were still called my friends. Um, I offended them. Graduation. Because I had one year of senior. I had one year of high school. I got out as a senior. Graduated because my grades were so good. I was terrible at school. Um, I graduated number two. Now I, so I had to speak to graduation and was told to tell stories about my past and the past of young people. <laughs> I don't think that's appropriate. Um, but I still told a joke that. Uh, Members of the cult who attended the town. So I was like, my mother was Which was fine. Sorry? 92. Got out in 91. I graduated in 92, and then I joined the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints in 94. No, at the end of my two. The end of my two. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Brazil. I, to go from um, the isolated, shy, PTSD ridden to, to like a person who wouldn't talk to strangers ever, perspective conversation, to being a missionary. <coughs> I'm still shy, but not really. But yeah, still very shy. But if I need to not be, what's up? I like your mask. Who, whose face is that? Cage. Nick Cage. <laughs> what? Anyway, this is a question that lets me know a lot about a person. What is the most illegal thing you've done that you feel? What do you know? Um, what's the most illegal thing I've done that I will admit to you? Uh, uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of speed, a lot of very obnoxious, to the point of like optional. What? Um, oh, step back. Uh, egregious and obnoxious trespassing. Like significant. I did some vandalism when I was a kid in Dallas, but you know, probably never. Yeah. What's that? Pineapple. Pineapple does not belong to pizza unless you're white. Anything else? Any other questions? Right. That doesn't surprise me. It's Canadian yeah, bacon, isn't it? I'm not into. I don't like sweet things on big pizza. Now in Brazil they have dessert pizza, but you know what's dessert pizza? It's not a tomato sauce. It's sweet. That's pizza. it's like ice creamy dessert frosting sauce with like a caramelized banana. There, it's pineapples that are. Um, did anybody on? Is anybody else still on Zoom? Thank you. Any other questions I can answer? I can, I'll answer anything about the cult, about linguistics. I have lots of What's that? Anything. If I, if I know the answer, I can, I can answer. Like, I'm curious where your son 
He came home. Um, he stayed home for two months. That's all hard. He's really yeah. 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 Uh, you've had some. No, almost for sure. What's your name? Uh, Thomas. Thomas. Okay. I'll uh, I'll miss you. Take care. Thanks for coming. Okay. That's pretty cool. Um, I'll, I'll mention. Missions are so different from where they were when I was. Okay. It's best that you can communicate every week. Right. Oh, okay. Oh, right on. Yeah, it's hard. It's a hard thing for a lot of these guys, you know, it's getting disrupted and pro bono arm with their mask mandates and stuff. Right. It's really hard. They can't get out. Right, yeah. I feel for him, but he, he just told us he's given the option to end Really? Like, Unless there's a chance that he'll go back. There's a chance to go back to Japan. So we'll yeah. yeah, I'm going to say something. Uh, well, Thomas, will, he's supposed to go through July. So, yeah. He, um, he was really lucky. He loved it. There for six months. Language picked up really fast. I mean, he was born in Japanese. So he picked it up really fast. Love school. Well, thanks for having me. I'm sorry that we didn't have much of a turnout. 26 people registered. So did they go? I don't know. I don't know if we just had staff issues or I don't know what happened. But it was fun. If you will, you can go Except, don't say any time until I say. I didn't say that. So I'll have to get it and send it to you. Uh -huh. Or drop it off to you or whatever. I apologize. Um, I got in trouble when I was moving these out for stacking them and dragging them because they just returned to the store. So if you can like put them on the rugs and then drag them. They don't want us dragging them on the new loop. Because I already you see this right here. Oh, that was I see nothing. I'm not that was me dragging the chairs out and they were like, ah! I'm not talking about this. Week. Sorry. <laughs> Trouble. I just repainted the wall, so I can't further come. Right. No. I didn't even know they had already done it. Do you know who that young lady was? I don't. I don't. I think oh. she was on the list of people that was true. Oh, she enjoyed it. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, look. Somebody else is in the waiting room. That's weird. Oh. Hi, Barbara. Yeah, sorry, Barbara. Ooh.